Halloween is often considered a celebration of the supernatural. However, the increasingly commercialised festivities are far removed from the important role ghosts played in daily life in the past. In this podcast, which explores the history of the supernatural in Ireland, I'm joined by Dr. Clodagh Tate, a historian in Mary Immaculate College Limerick, who's an expert on the history of the supernatural. Our fascinating conversation focuses on what are called crisis apparitions. In layman's terms, these are ghosts whose appearance usually heralded an imminent death. We also explored the Irish supernatural more generally, asking why ghost stories exist alongside their role and place in our history. The episode also includes a reading from an Irish ghost story that took place in Philadelphia. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire. The topic of today's show, A History of the Supernatural in Ireland, is not something I would have given much consideration or thought to until I read a recent article by my guest, Dr. Clodagh Tate, which detailed the intriguing role ghosts played in Irish society until relatively recent times. This article, where Clodagh elaborates on a lot of the ideas we discuss in this show, is linked below, so you can check that out after the episode. Later in this podcast, I also have a reading from a voice actor, Therese Murray, of an early 20th century account of a ghost that's worth waiting for alone. Before we dive into what is a fascinating conversation, don't forget you can get your copy of my new book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders. Now, if you want the book right now, you can download it as an audiobook narrated by myself that's available through Audible. With Christmas on the horizon, if you want to get the book as a present for someone, order it now and make sure you get it on time. I have a list of links in the show notes below to where you can buy the book. It's available through all good booksellers. Sound on the episode is by Kate Dunley. I think it's fair to say the history of the supernatural is not an aspect of the past we think about much. I at least would be guilty of dismissing it out of hand. So I began my conversation with Clodagh by asking her about the history of the supernatural in general and what drew her to it. As you're about to hear, accounts and stories of ghosts and the wider supernatural can be really useful to the historian. Well, the thing about the history of the the supernatural is that it's really a history of people and people telling their own stories of their own experiences or the experiences of their loved ones, So I suppose. That's one of the the major attractions of it, alongside the the liveliness of the stories themselves. But I think as a historian, what particularly draws me to stories of the the supernatural is the the fact that they give us an insight into what people thought in the past, what's going on in their heads. It doesn't matter whether I believe in ghosts or whether the person telling the story themselves actually believed what they were telling or whether the listeners believe in ghosts. What matters to me, I think, is that the, the, the story reveals what is important to people, what's going on inside their heads, how they see the world. The ghost story might be only kind of incidental to the information that it can reveal about uh, other things along the way. I mean, I'm looking at a, an early modern ghost story at the moment from the end of the, the 17th century, where the ghost story is all very interesting and tells us a lot about what's going on in people's head. But, but you know, in the course of it, it also tells us what's in people's houses, it tells us about gender relationships, relationships between women and, uh, and men and so on. So ghost stories can give insights into all of these uh, kind of things in a very entertaining way. Much of our conversation focused on ghosts that are associated with death. But before we get into that, I asked Clodagh to explain the Irish supernatural more generally. Now, I found this really useful because so much of our understanding of ghosts is shaped by popular culture. We often think of them as apparitions covered by a sheet intent on scaring a victim. But the reality, certainly in the past in Ireland, was quite different. Yeah, very rarely in Irish tradition, at least, do you find ghosts appearing in a, in a white sheet. They're often recognisably themselves. And so it can actually be a little bit difficult to d- distinguish the different occasions where recognisable visions of a person actually appear. And I do, in the article, distinguish between the, 
the crisis operation, which is what I'm particularly interested in in that article, uh, the wraith or, or fetch and the ghost. So the crisis apparition is just one of the variety of occasions when a recognisable vision of a person appears before a death, at the time of the death or after a death. So in Irish tradition, particularly in the north of the, the country, the vision of a living person might appear as an omen of that person's own death. And this is what gets called a fetch or a wraith. The wraith seems to be a term used kind of further north in Ireland, the, the fetch further south. So this is where a person sees someone who is known to be alive, but to be in a different place. So you might be walking through the fields and you see ahead of you someone you know, but when you get back to your house, you find out that the person has been there all of the time. This is usually taken as an omen of death that that person will die within a, a month or, or within a short time of their fetch or wraith having been seen. And then, of course, in Irish tradition, there are plenty of accounts as well of what we might term traditional ghosts, appearances of those known definitively to be dead. So Irish ghosts are often often quite attached to their own place. They often appear in their own houses or in graveyards near the, the grave that they had been buried in. Irish ghosts often take very recognisable form as well. So they're not in the sheep, they're recognisable as themselves. Irish ghosts might actually be quite demanding. So Irish ghosts are often presented as being quite talkative. If they come into close contact with a living person, they're often doing so because they're, they're looking for that person to do something for them. So they will address them and they'll actually ask for what, what they want. And so it was assumed that if you saw a ghost, that you didn't run away screaming, that the ghost actually wanted something and you needed to to stand your ground and actually uh, have a chat with them. So, you know, the next time you you see your granny at the end of your bed, make sure you you you, you don't run away screaming, that you, that you actually do ask what that person actually wants. And of course, as well, we have to remember that in Irish folklore, sometimes when the dead returned, they were not necessarily dead. Some people who were supposed to be dead appeared because they they weren't actually dead, that they'd been taken by the fairies. And so we know that the idea of the fairy changeling is very strong in, in certain parts of Ireland. And that's, that kind of phenomenon has been studied by folklorists like Angela Burke and uh, Patricia Lysett, and also by the English folklorist Simon Young. So there could be a chance as well that those who are supposed to be dead aren't actually dead. Now, the specific type of ghost we focused on is something called a crisis apparition. While you might not be familiar with that specific term, you may well have heard stories that fit into this category. I'll let Cloda explain what they are. So I suppose I, I mentioned the idea that the ghost proper is often very, very much associated with their own place. But crisis apparitions are really interesting because they often appear across long distances. And a crisis apparition, as I define it, is a vision of a recognisable person who appears to a friend or a family member at around the time of their death elsewhere. Now, crisis apparitions, generally, they don't speak. They sometimes speak, but usually they don't. And they're usually just encountered for a short amount of time. So you're not talking about a recurring vision that this person appears at the time they're dying elsewhere to someone well known to them. And then another feature of crisis apparition stories is that the percipient, the person who perceives the vision, might declare what they've seen to someone else. And a common feature of crisis apparition stories is that the death of the individual who had been seen would subsequently be verified by a letter or a telegram. And it's sometimes the case as well that crisis apparitions kind of bear the mark of the fact that they are dead or dying, that their bodies might might show that. One woman, for example, who sees a, a crisis apparition, she perceives her as dead at the time of the division, she's lying in her own bed and she sees her sister lying across from her with her hand outside of the covers and she knows her to be dead. So the crisis apparition sometimes bears the mark of the fact that they are dying or have just died. OK, so while these ghosts take the form of someone who is about to die, I wanted to know more about what it was like to experience this. Did the ghost appear to a person in a dream 
or were they awake when it appeared? Some people are definitively awake or they describe themselves as having been awake or ha- they describe the person who has seen the vision because often these are being told at second or third or fourth hand. And so they describe the person who has seen the vision as being awake at the time of the the apparition. And I think that's the most common experience. But some people do perceive the vision in a dream and that that they specifically say that they they were asleep and that that they dreamt this vision as well. So So you can get kind of variety of experiences in that manner. These stories are usually bound up in wider history, particularly migration, sometimes on a local level, but more often transatlantic migration. So there are a surprising number of accounts of people in Ireland experiencing a vision of someone who is in America in particular, or people in America experiencing a vision of somebody who is in Ireland at the time of their death. The distances could be shorter. I mean, you could be, you know, there's one account from the 1820s of a woman. I think she's in Limerick and she sees her cousin who has died in Kilrush. So the distances could be a good bit shorter than that. Not usually, I think, 10 doors down. I think it's kind of part of the impressiveness of the crisis apparition that the person is at some distance away at the time the death is announced uh, somewhere else. And then the, the kind of confirmation comes in the in the form of a letter or, or a telegram. So the, the distance, I think, is important to, to, to crisis apparitions, but it's not inevitably a huge distance. It's just more impressive if you see someone who has died in America and you announce the death and then you get the telegram to say that they definitely have died. Okay, so I think it's time for an example now. The following account, read by Therese Murray, dates from the early 20th century. It's worth providing a little bit of context to its origins. So in 1913, the clergyman, St John Seymour, published a letter in numerous Irish newspapers appealing for readers to send him their experiences of the supernatural. These were then published the following year in a book, True Irish Ghost Stories. The following is one of the stories submitted by an Irish woman, Mary Murnan, who lived in Philadelphia. On the 4th of August, 1886, at 10.30 o'clock in the morning, I left my own house, 21 Montrose Street, Philadelphia, to do some shopping. I had not proceeded more than 50 yards when on turning the corner of the street, I observed my aunt approaching me within five or six yards. I was greatly astonished for the last letter I had from home stated that she was dying of consumption, but the thought occurred to me that she might have recovered somewhat and come out to Philadelphia. This opinion was quickly changed as we approached each other, for our eyes met, and she had the colour of one who had risen from the grave. I seemed to feel my hair stand on end, for just as we were about to pass each other, she turned her face towards me and I gasped, My God, she is dead and is going to speak to me. But no word was spoken, and she passed on. After proceeding a short distance, I looked back and she continued on to Washington Avenue where she disappeared from me. There was no other person near at the time and being so close, I was well able to note what she wore. She held a sunshade over her head, and the clothes and hat were those I knew so well before I left Ireland. I wrote home telling what I had seen, and asking if she was dead. I received a reply saying she was not dead at the date I saw her, but had been asking if a letter had come from me for some days before her death. It was just two days before she actually died that I had seen her. Her story has all the hallmarks of the type of ghost Cloda is talking about. It's appearing thousands of miles from home and it was clear when Mary Mernan saw her aunt's face she knew she was dying. However, there are aspects of this story that are strange. While the ghostly apparition of Mary Mernan's aunt appeared in the streets of Philadelphia, the woman herself, that is her aunt, had not yet died back in Ireland. However, the idea that the woman could appear in two places at once may have made more sense in the past given traditional Irish ideas surrounding death that saw it as a process rather than an instant event. I suppose even medical people in the present day will point out that 
there is not a distinctive one moment of death, but in lots of traditional societies, there, there seems to have been a sense that death was a process that occurred over a period of time. And in the article, I draw on the work of the Hungarian anthropologist Peter Bersha, and he's looked at the mechanics. He was he's interested in death omens, so so the the, the foreannouncement of of death or the the forewarning of death. And he points out that in Romanian and Hungarian peasant uh, communities, death is viewed as being reversible in certain situations, and that death is viewed in those communities as a process before the moment of death. The soul might already be understood to be on a journey. And it was believed that in the hours following death, that the corpse was still animate in some way. It only slowly lost its ability to sense or perceive what was going on around it. So in those traditions, crying for the dead was prohibited for about three hours after a death had had occurred in case the soul might be interrupted in what it's doing or it might be called back. And we see very similar prohibitions against uh, crying for the dead and also pro- prohibitions against preparing the remains for, for burial for a few hours after death in, in Ireland. So there are various accounts in the folklore traditions where, where people are forbidden from, from crying or keening the dead for a few hours. And in some places, the the deceased person would actually be left alone, entirely alone in a room for a few hours in order that God could judge the soul. So it was often believed that that, that there's a few hours there where where the soul is being judged after death. So I found this quite interesting, this idea that the spirit of a person close to death or at the time of their death might for a period of time be almost kind of unmoored from the constraints of the the body or the afterlife and and might thus perhaps in that time be free to appear across shorter or longer distances. And so I think these ideas around the the process of dying might help explain why the idea of crisis apparitions and the the kind of wider category of fetches and, and, and rates and even ghosts might have fitted easily within Irish worldviews. Now, before making this episode, I would have considered the idea of ghosts as something rooted in very old medieval or even prehistoric beliefs. But what surprised me about the crisis apparition Clodagh was talking about is that they are very modern. They're rooted in pretty modern historical processes like mass Irish emigration in the aftermath of the Great Hunger and even modern technology, for that time at least, in the telegram. Yeah, I think so. I'm looking at stories of crisis apparitions that date between about the 1820s and the 1940s. And as you, as you say, this is a time of kind of rapid modernization um, and whatever you might mean by that term. And I was struck by the fact that even the kind of shortest, most sketchy stories of crisis apparitions often mention these kind of technologies and mentions the uh, crisis apparition, particularly being confirmed by a, a telegram and telegrams can arrive very quickly. So we do have that impression that modern technologies contributed to the decline of traditional beliefs, I suppose. Electricity is the the prime example. Ghosts are often believed to have disappeared with the advent of electric light or the arrival of the Late Late Show meant that people no longer told stories of fairies around the fire of an evening because everybody's watching Gay Burn instead. And of course, that is partly the case. But if we look more closely, we find that technology and new ideas can have a far more complex relationship with folk belief and uh, and supernatural beliefs. In the case of crisis apparitions, modern technologies of communication are actually recruited in some way to prove the apparitions. A telegram travels impressively fast, but the crisis apparition travels faster. It it spreads the news even even more quickly than the, the telegram. Or perhaps it kind of cushions the blow of the telegram because you can imagine, you know, how how shocking it might have been to have your loved one in America and how suddenly you might not have any warning that they're real and suddenly a telegram arrives. So in some ways, actually, the crisis apparition kind of intervenes to to cushion modernity in in some way and, and perhaps give people some reassurance that if somebody died, that they might know in some way in advance before this kind of sudden shocking announcement. I was struck as well by the the number of crisis apparitions that relate to the the First World War. And of course, we know that 
news of the of deaths in the First World War often arriving very very suddenly out of the the, the blue by telegram. Crisis apparitions are, you know, they aren't modern. We know that they they appear earlier on. They appear. There are accounts of crisis apparitions in the 16th and, and 17th centuries as well. But but perhaps they continue to be relevant and believable because they fit it in well with modern technologies. Now, I'm sceptical when it comes to the supernatural, but I do think these stories existed for a purpose. I asked Clora why she thinks people told these stories and why they were so important in the past. I suppose the entertainment in itself can can be a function. And I think historians like me can often kind of slip into these kind of functionalist explanations for kind of finding some some role for stories like this when a lot of the time they're they're told because they're interesting or they're shocking or they're surprising and that is their their main function but i think in in the article i do do kind of look for for functions of these kinds of stories as to why they remain so vivid and why why they are so regularly told and I guess I found a few different things. In the first place, I note the, the function of vivid stories like this in kind of remembering and hand, handing on the dead. Crisis apparition stories are often not just about the oddness of the apparition, but also about the closeness of the connection between the percipient in the story and the person that they actually saw. So people are in some ways not just recollecting this unusual event that has happened, but they're also inside the story. We we get at loving, close relationships between mothers and their sons, between in the story from the 1820s that I mentioned uh, earlier, between a woman and her, her cousin. So in some ways, part of the, the function is that they're, they're kind of handing on or, or handing down the dead, giving some giving us some some sort of memory of a of a close uh, connection that is a connection that is so close that the, the people are almost kind of telepathically linked or something like that, that the special event has happened at the time of, of the death or one, of one or other of them. I also, I guess, see part of the role of crisis apparitions as assisting in the work of grieving or grief work. Anthropologists, again, like Ellen Padone, who writes about Brittany, they've noted how accounts of death omens can function to aid people to come to terms with a death, especially an unexpected death. If somebody has died at a distance from you, there, there might have been nothing you could do to assist them or to comfort them or reassure them at that time. But at least the, the crisis apparition stories can maybe give some reassurance to hearers that they, they could have some connection to a dying person, even when that person was, was far away uh, from them, that the dead you know, even if they're thousands of miles away, might have might find some means of of kind of reaching out to those that they're leaving behind and, and comforting them, reassuring them that they were in their thoughts at the time of the uh, of the death. So so kind of there's a comfort, there's a, there's a reassurance, there's a kind of contribution to the work of of grieving there as well as people kind of recollected these stories and, and discussed them and thought about them in the, in the period after a death had had occurred. And of course, the, the message of the, the crisis apparition, even if it's unexpected and even if it's shocking, I think, turned over in memory, it can provide a certain amount of, of comfort to those who have been bereaved. This left me wondering if the people who told these stories genuinely believed that they or someone they knew had seen a ghost. Here's Claudia's take on that. Yeah, I guess it's difficult to answer that because I, I, I suppose in some cases, even if you don't believe in ghosts or kind of warnings or signs from the beyond or anything like that, um, if there is, you know, something odd or something strange that you can still draw a little bit of possibility for from that, 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 that there might be some, some possibility of, of communication there. And even just the belief in the perhaps there's a possibility there might be comforting or, or helpful to you. But it does seem from the, the stories of themselves as they're, they're told, I have some particularly vivid ones, that 
individuals genuinely believed that they had had some communication from their their dying, their dead loved ones, that they carried this with them, that they told these stories as true over a number of years. And often it seems that these stories are so impressive that they'll be passed down kind of further generations as well. Again, you know, to, to return that to that story of the woman who sees her her cousin in the 1820s. It's not she who who writes down this story. It's actually her daughter. And her daughter says that she'd heard her mother repeat that her heard her mother repeat this story dozens of times, that she was absolutely convinced of its reality. And clearly the daughter is so impressed by the story as well, or, or, or finds the story so so meaningful that she goes to the trouble when she's called upon uh, to do so decades later. She she goes to the trouble of, of writing down um, the story and, and verifying its details for the, the researchers who are interested in it. And several of the other stories as well are clearly very strongly believed in by the, the tellers of the story and that those tellers do draw comfort and, and encouragement from those stories as well. Through our conversation, I referred to these phenomena as something our ancestors experienced and shared. But the more Claude had talked about crisis apparitions, the more I realised I've heard people tell very similar stories about something that happened to them or to a family member. I bet lots of you have too. So I asked Claude about their popularity today. She explains why the type of story being told is changing. They certainly do exist. I don't think people tell old stories of crisis apparitions that often, but you will definitely encounter people who tell crisis apparition type stories. I can think of at least two occasions where people have told me stories of this kind from their own experience that they definitively believed that had happened to them, that a a dying or recently dead person had had appeared to them in, in some way communicated with them. So I think there could definitely be work done on these kind of stories in in the present day who tells them and what kind of stories are told and you may, maybe how do they relate to to the, the kind of earlier tradition that I'm, I'm talking about in the article. So if somebody wants to give me lots of funding to, to talk to people, to get them to tell me their ghost stories, I'd be delighted to receive it. I want to thank Claudia for her time. It was a really fascinating discussion. I have her article, Spectres Across the Atlantic, 1820 to 1940, Communicating with the Dead Over Space and Time, linked below. The copyright on the book I took that story from, True Irish Ghost Stories, is also expired, so I have a link to that on archive.org if you want to read more accounts like the one earlier in the show. That's it for today's show, folks. All that's left for me to say is, until next time, Sloan. Thank you.